I met him, you know, not long ago. Hofstetter, I mean. Does it affect your own life, uh, your ideas about how thinking works? Well, it makes me look at people slightly differently, maybe. It makes me uh, uh, feel differently about what's going on inside people. It makes me sometimes maybe feel more empathy and sometimes less empathy. It's a funny thing. I think uh, when you take a, a view of people that sees them as, as built up of billions and billions of parts that they know nothing of, in a way you feel sorry for them, that they don't understand how they work. But in another way you feel that, um, that they are more mechanical than they think they are. And that, they're, that they're, they're sort of, there's a sort of a helplessness and that nobody can help what they're doing. And in so on one level you feel, well, then you feel sorry for them because they're helpless. They can't help it. And on another level you feel that there's nothing there to feel sorry for. So what about yourself? Because you must have those same feelings about yourself. Sure, yeah, I watch my own decisions and I feel sometimes as if decisions come from parts of me that uh, I realize are, are not under what I would call my control. I realize that, that my own self is really not under my control. I look at the, uh, I look at more what I prefer in life, my tastes, my interests, my aesthetic preferences. And I know that those things come from places that I certainly don't decide upon. I am just a victim of my brain. And, but I have to live with that. And, and uh, I mean, I'm a victim of my brain in that I can't play music as well as I would like to be able to. But I, I don't know. It's, it's a very complex thing. I, I think... Uh, it's being, uh, being a good human being seems to be the uh, 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 much more deep thing in life than being able to explain human beings. But still, um, trying to explain them is a fascinating thing. So when I finished the book, I became so fascinated, I called him up and I made an appointment. But why are you so interested in him? My work. Why don't you come along? I'll show you. So tell me, how did the conversation go? What did you say to him? artificial intelligence well, it's, uh, about trying to understand how the mind works in my opinion some people don't think that some people think it's all about creating machines that will take over the roles of people but I don't think it's a challenge to people not in the near not in the near future the way I see it is uh, the more we understand about intelligence the more we see how hard it is to make machines do what people do, but from my v viewpoint, the only way to unravel the complexity of all the different things going on when we think is to try to model it. Yeah. And so computers, computers are a medium in which we can model anything that we want, from hurricanes to, you know, mathematics to physics, anything that we want can be modeled inside a computer. The way I think of intelligence is that Intelligence came from the fact that 
beings existed in a world that was unpredictable. And the most important thing, it seemed, was to be able to deal with an unpredictable world where you couldn't anticipate anything that was going to happen. You had patterns that sort of got the idea, but those patterns uh, had to be learned over a long period of time. And the ability to pick up patterns uh, in a very, very uh, uh, diversified world became the most important ability of beings with brains. What do you mean by a pattern? Well, I mean, I mean things that, uh, I mean, for example, here are two books. We look at these and we say they're books. To, uh, to a fly, that's not evident that those things are books. And it's not evident that these three things have anything in common. Uh, they are of different sizes. They are of different colors. Um, by pattern, what I mean is some sort of essence of a thing that we feel is invariant. And so that would be a key concept in, in a model of thinking then? Absolutely. This, the ability to take a situation that you're, not, that you're not familiar with and to get at very quickly what the essential parts of that situation are, even though you've never been in that situation before, and to ignore the silly or superficial aspects. That is really the critical element of intelligence. So artificial intelligence is after finding out what that is and simulating it? That's right, simulating it on a computer, writing a, some sort of computer program that, that has that ability, or designing a computer architecture that uh, will have that ability, or doing both together, developing in general computer systems that are more and more like, um, that have more and more of the flexibility of a human brain. an eccentric but very important to the firm. His attitude was straightforward enough. He considered biological life as a complex form of machinery. But he also believed in the human self, and he proved it existed. Yeah, sure he did. He envisaged the soul as a physical entity. Not material, of course, but just as real as gravitational fields or radio waves. A physical entity? Certainly. How else could a soul be connected to a machine? I thought a soul was supposed to be connected to a biological body. It is. But as I said, biological life is just another form of machinery. Animal and human bodies are more than just machines. I mean, the reproductive act itself makes us different, don't you think? Why is it so wonderful that one biological machine should beget another biological machine? Being pregnant made me acutely aware that I was simply nothing more than a machine. I didn't have to do anything. I didn't have to plan, say, let's start a new finger before breakfast, or maybe grow a few thousand brain cells before lunch, or even get the liver finished during afternoon grocery shopping. Honestly, it takes much less intelligence to create a child than it does to warm a TV dinner. Yes, but doesn't the machine have maternal feelings? Well, it's very difficult to know who or what has maternal feelings. On the farm where I was brought up, we had a brood sow with an unfortunate tendency to crush most of her offspring to death. Accidentally, I imagine. Would you say she had maternal feelings? I'm not talking about pigs. We could talk about humans in the same breath. Would you care to estimate how many newborn babies drown in toilets? I don't want to argue with you, but I do not relate to machines. Emotionally speaking, there's a difference between the way we treat machines and the way we treat animals that defies logical explanation. I mean, uh, it doesn't bother me to, to break a machine, but uh, I cannot kill an animal. Do you eat meat? Look, that argument misses a point about basic respect for life. 
we have something in common with animals. You do see that, don't you? Well, maybe our biological kinship has nothing to do with your respect for life. You don't like to kill simply because the animal resists death. It cries, it struggles, it looks sad, it begs you not to destroy it. And it is your mind, by the way, and not your biological body, that hears the animal's plea. Animal. It's cute, but what's the point of it? I'd like you to kill it. What are you talking about? Why should I kill, I mean, why should I break that machine? Just as an experiment. I tried it myself a few years ago and I found it instructive. What did you learn? Something about the meaning of life and death. The beast has no defenses that can harm you. Just don't crash into anything while you're chasing it around. run down in about half an hour provided you keep him busy there is an easier way to get it I'll take it forget the hammer just pick it up pick it up just like that certainly it only feels danger from its own kind and in this case, it's the steel hammerhead. It's programmed to trust unarmed protoplasm. Now lay him on his back on the table. He'll be quite helpless. And then you can bash him at your leisure. Just a machine. Like these, its evolutionary predecessors. But unlike them, it senses its own doom and can cry out for help. Turn it off. Oh, you ruined the switch. Care to administer the death blow? a million neurons somewhere in my brain that are firing in some pattern where they all agree with each other. They're all reinforcing each other and saying, yes, that's good. Uh, now, that pattern might be the par characteristic pattern that occurs whenever I see a book. 
And so this characteristic pattern means that I am seeing a book or thinking about the concept of book. Now with some other um, concept like table, that means a different set of neurons is all firing and reinforcing each other and cooperatively forming an organization of neurons that say table. The most important cells in the brain are nerve cells, or neurons. Each neuron possesses a number of synapses, or entry ports, a cell body, and one axon, or output channel. The input and output are electrochemical flows of moving ions. In the cell body, a simple decision is made. If the sum of all the inputs exceeds a certain threshold, it fires a pulse of ions down the axon. These ions will eventually cross over into the entry ports of other neurons, thus causing them to make the same kind of decision. It is simple addition which rules the lowest level of the mind. So now, how do you connect the tiny little cells with thinking? How does it... Uh, well, what kind of model do you have for that? On their own, those little cells do, are not thinking, obviously. They are, um, their activity is um, very distant from thinking. In fact, the activity that takes place in any neuron in the brain is no different from the activity that takes place in a nerve cell in your finger. It's just that when you put them together and allow them to uh, very intensely exchange information, then you allow these kinds of macroscopic states to exist. Um, so in, in some models of artificial intelligence, um, the idea is to create a model, not necessarily for a neuron, but for a very small computational activity, and have that very small activity uh, be able to cooperate with other very small activities and have them send messages back and forth. And out of this whole uh, activity involving many small pieces, a uh, program will get a coherent large-scale behavior. More concrete. I want to know more about how that works. How does that work in the brain? How does that work in a computer? Yeah, this story of trying to fill in how the details work, how, how a, a, a unitary thing like consciousness can, can emerge uh, out of millions, billions of little things happening. That's been one of my real interests over the years because it is a mystery. I mean, you don't have to start, you don't even have to think of neurons as the smallest elements. I mean, w even when as a child I learned that I was made of atoms, that was a shocking thought because it, it somehow reduced me to a vast collection of invisible little things, all of whom all these little things were obeying the laws of physics. Where did that leave me any room to have any free will or to have any control? And I, I was concerned about that, I remember. Well, that is a problem. I, I like to think of the microscopic activity in a, in a living being, but particularly in a brain. And, and through, this, through this analogy, which uh, I call the carinium, it's a little pun in English because, of course, it's based on the word cranium for our skull, and uh, there was a, a very famous brain researcher who wrote uh, a sentence once in one of his papers. He said, who shoves whom around inside the cranium? And his question, what he really meant was, are the, are the laws of physics shoving around little tiny particles in such a way that there's no room left for free will or anything, or are the things like desires and beliefs and hopes and ideas, are those kinds of things shoving around the electrons? Now, which way is the better way to think of it? Imagine the corinium to be a vast space in the neural activity as small yellow marbles or sims bouncing around continuously like the ion pulses flowing from cell to cell. They have a lot of freedom, but they are constrained by larger objects, and so they prefer certain pathways, like the neural activity. But what are these obstacles? Imagine the marbles to be magnetic, 
sometimes they stick together. We could call these groups symbols, like the groups of brain cells that form more or less stable structures and that fire together most of the time. It looks like the symbols are stationary and determine the direction of the marbles. But if you could speed up the film, you would see the symbols move themselves, pushed by many sims going in approximately the same direction. They even seem to interact with each other. Suppose the marbles are shut in according to conditions from outside. For instance, if there is a green light, the amount of marbles from there increases. We might draw causal connections between the light and the movements inside the corineum. It seems the symbols do not like green light. When the light is off again, something of the situation before remains visible in the arrangement of the symbols. The symbols remember the light. Of course, in reality, the green light doesn't interact directly with brain cells, but through the eyes. The pulse of ions that goes through the optic nerve and enters the brain initiates a complex process of symbol forming. In the end, a pulse returns to the muscles of the mouth and tongue. Together they say, I see a green light. This we call consciousness, the ability to perceive, to then mirror this perception in the structures of the brain, and to be able to express this to the world. Who shoves whom around inside the cranium? Are the symbols shoving around the activities in the cells, or are the cells manipulating the symbols? Is it the interaction of the symbols that really matters? Or is maybe consciousness above all of this directing everything? It really all seems to depend on the level from which you look at it. Um, one, of, one of the views is when you are concentrating on the microscopic and not seeing the macroscopic. You're concentrating on the little teeny things that are happening and not seeing the large things. And the other view is where you only see the large things and not the small things. Now, if you take that as a metaphor, you can try to think about um, how people look at themselves how people feel themselves. People aren't capable of feeling the little tiny actions in their brains. It's as if all they feel is the activity of symbols, that is, things that symbolize the real world, concepts. It's, it's symbol is another word for concept, in a way. And all that we feel in our minds is this high-level activity where various things that are symbolic trigger other things that are symbolic. Symbolic activity triggers other symbolic activity. So how many levels was he thinking of? He didn't know exactly. He said it was easy to think of it in uh, orders of magnitude. You know, powers of ten. In human society, that makes sense. You jump from a person to a family. Now, that may not be exactly a factor of ten, but it's something like that. Then you go to a neighborhood, uh, from a neighborhood to a community, to a small town, and then to a county that jumps to a state, and so on. Now, there are about 100 billion neurons in the brain, so there would be 11 such steps. But it is not clear that the neuron itself shouldn't be subdivided in three, four, five levels, maybe. And there's levels of time as well. The action of a single neuron takes place within milliseconds, but thoughts seem to be in a feeling of seconds. So then, consciousness is the highest level or rather, consciousness of oneself. That's right, that's right. Look, over there is the building that houses the artificial intelligence lab of the MIT. First of all, I think that a prerequisite for consciousness is the feeling that a system is mirroring the external world somehow, that it, it, it seems to uh, understand what is out there. Um, well, that kind of thing is, uh, in other words, perception is the, uh, is the, is the thing that a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of 
the models that have been developed uh, uh, have shown to be, they've shown that collective activity of this sort uh, is actually the best kind of model. That is, a lot of microscopic activity adding up. It seems clear in the brain that that's what's happening, that certain large symbolic structures are, are activated from below. That means from the microscopic level. Um, that means that, in other words, we can say very clearly that certain structures are woken up or are brought into existence uh, when the world outside uh, is triggering the sensory parts, like the eyes or the ears, in certain ways. So characteristic parts of the brain are woken up in response to certain kinds of parts in the exterior environment. And if one can feel that those parts in the brain that are woken up are stably connected with the outside world, then one feels there's a perceptual system involved. If there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between things that that are out there and things that are in here, then one feels there's a, a, real, a real sense of the system mirroring inside itself what's going on outside. How do you establish that? Um, I suppose the one way of, of uh, saying that it's established is when the, um, well, you could, you could look at it uh, through um, experimentation. One thing actually brain research has shown recently, it's been very interesting, that people are being beginning to be able to watch activity in the brain uh, during different kinds of um, activity. For example, if I'm uh, playing the piano, uh, you, can, you can insert certain kinds of um, uh, radioactive materials inside my brain and then uh, watch which parts of my brain are most actively doing certain kinds of things. And you can actually get um, photographs of the brain activity. And that means that you can actually localize certain concepts to certain places in the brain. Mm -hmm. That hasn't yet been done in such, uh, such extremely accurate way. But uh, we don't know where the concept of dog is inside my head. Mm -hmm. But um, we, that's because we don't yet have the microscopic uh, or the precision to, to get at very small areas of the brain. We can only ver watch very crudely right now. self-consciousness. There's another level of consciousness, which is not only that there's a mirroring of the external world, but there's a mirroring of the internal world. That the system can watch some of its own activity and register that activity in its own structures so that the system is constantly aware of what it's doing. And there's no reason that uh, it would be any harder. In fact, it should be easier for the system to get access uh, to whatever is going on inside it. It doesn't need uh, eyes or ears to figure out what's inside the head. To figure out what's outside, of course, it does need sensory organs. To figure out what's inside, it, it has direct access to what's inside. Um, so a system that can watch itself watching the world is, seems very close to what we believe of uh, consciousness, or what consciousness is. You know Daniel Dennett, the philosopher? He's a friend of Hofstadter's. You know, they published The Mind's Eye together. Yeah, that's him. He's a strange man. He works at Tufts University, somewhere around here. I spoke to him, too, you know. Several years ago, and as you know, I looked quite different then, I was approached by Pentagon officials who asked me to volunteer for a top secret and highly dangerous mission in collaboration with NASA and Howard Hughes, the Department of Defense was spending billions trying to develop a supersonic 
tunneling underground device, or stud for short. We were trying to develop a sort of rocket to tunnel through the Earth's core at high speed and to deliver a specially designed atomic warhead right up the Red's missile silos. It never passed the experimental stages. In an early trial, the warhead got stuck about a mile deep under Tulsa, Oklahoma. That's why we approached Professor Dennett to retrieve the warhead. We knew about his interest in brain research, and we knew about his personal bravery. Both of these were essential in this case, but maybe Dr. Minsky should explain that. Well, the problem was that the uh, device was fiercely radioactive, but in a new way. Monitoring systems had shown us that the nature of the device and the interaction with pockets of material deep in the Earth uh, produced a radioactivity that caused severe abnormalities in the brain tissue. It was quite harmless to other organs and tissues of the body. So, uh, we decided to ask the person who was to retrieve the warhead to, uh, to leave his brain behind. We uh, constructed a new sort of life support system. That way the brain could go on exercising its normal functions by elaborate radio links. In other words, we asked Dennett permission to uh, remove his brain to store in a vat at the manned spacecraft center in Houston, Texas. Now each input pathway and output pathway, as it was severed, was restored by a pair of micro-miniaturized radio transceivers, uh, one of which was attached precisely to the brain in Houston, and the other to the nerve stumps in the empty cranium. So no information would be lost, and all connectivity would be preserved. Yeah, then it was a bit, uh, <laughs> a bit reluctant at first, <laughs> but uh, yeah, well, we managed to convince them. They showed me around the life support lab in Houston. Uh, they'd made a sparkling new vat for my brain, and I was introduced to the distinguished support team of neurologists, hematologists, bioengineers, electrical engineers, biophysicists, they put me through an enormous array of tests, blood tests, brain scans, experiments, interviews, and the like. They took down my biography at great length, recorded tedious lists of my beliefs, hopes, fears, tastes. They even made lists of my favorite stereo recordings and put me through a crash course in psychoanalysis. Of the operation itself, I don't remember anything because I was anesthetized. But when I opened my eyes and looked around, I asked the traditional, inevitable, lamentably hackneyed post-operative question, where am I? Where am I? You're in Houston. the operation was a success. I want to go see my brain. is the output transmission switch. See for yourself. Susan. Well, here I am, 
sitting in a chair, staring through a piece of plate glass at my own brain. But wait, shouldn't I have thought, here I am suspended in a bubbling fluid being stared at by my own eyes? Here am I, Daniel Dennett, suspended in a bubbling fluid being stared at by my own eyes. Here am I, Daniel Dennett, suspended in a bubbling fluid, being stared at by my own eyes. Here am I, Daniel Dennett, suspended in a bubbling fluid, being stared at by my own eyes. It was very confusing for him. You know, he's a philosopher of strong physicalist conviction. So he really believed that thoughts occur somewhere in your brain. He just couldn't think himself in the vet. So, to orient himself, he used the philosopher's ploy. He began naming things. Yorick, you are my brain. The rest of my body I dub Hamlet. So, here we all are. Yorick is my brain, Hamlet is my body, and I am Dennett. Now, where am I? There were three possibilities. First, where Hamlet goes, goes Dennett. Well, that is unlikely. If you and I switch brains, it would still be me in your body. My brain would still remember my life. Well, exactly, exactly. But where your goes, because then it wasn't very attractive either. It just didn't feel like he was in the vet. So, he thought up another argument. What if his body would rob a bank in California? <laughs> where would he be tried? <laughs> the third possibility is that the man is wherever he thinks he is. Point of view, in other words. But that's an unclear notion. You can be mistaken. Anyway, this sort of example gave Dennett the idea that he could teach himself to be in the vet, if only he practiced. Hey, let's test your new nervous system before we send you out on this dangerous mission. Accommodation is not perfect, however, and to this day I'm plagued by minor coordination difficulties. The speed of light is fast, but finite, and as my body and my brain get farther apart, the delicate interaction of my feedback systems is thrown into disarray by the time lags. It's not noticeable. But in any case, to get back to my adventure, soon the doctors and I were in agreement that I was ready to undertake my subterranean mission. Great. Let's go, huh?
Hello, Houston. Come in, Houston. This is Houston. Where are you now? I've reached the missile. I'm sure glad I left my brain behind. There's so much radiation the Geiger counter exploded. So what do I do now? Okay, find the cover to the guidance system. It's marked TS-545-7. I already found it. Okay, see the switch? Switch it off. It's jammed. Damn. You'll have to cross past the detonator. You see the wires? There's a red one and a blue one. Cut the red one. And don't touch that circuit board behind it. The decision chip is on it. You'll blow up a large part of Oklahoma if you short circuit the board. <laughs> I wish you'd had your own decision ships checked before you launched this thing. Oh well, here we go. Apparently, the auditory transceivers had gone on the fritz. I could no longer hear Houston or my own voice, but I could speak. So. I began telling them what had happened. In mid-sentence, I knew something else had gone wrong. My vocal apparatus had become paralyzed. And then my right hand went limp. Another transceiver gone. I cursed my luck, because there I was, deaf, dumb, and blind in a radioactive hole more than a mile deep under Tulsa. And then I was faced with an even more shocking problem, for as the last radio link died out. Suddenly, I was disembodied in Houston. I didn't recognize my new status immediately, of course. It took me several anxious minutes before it dawned on me that my poor body lay several hundred miles away, with heart pulsing and lungs respirating, but otherwise as dead as the body of any heart transplant donor its skull packed with useless, broken electronic gear. The shift in perspective that I had earlier found well nigh impossible was now quite natural. In fact, though I could think myself back into that body in Tulsa, I, it took some effort to sustain the illusion, and surely it was an illusion, for I'd lost all contact with that body. It occurred to me then, in one of those rushes of revelation we should always be suspicious of, that I'd stumbled upon an impressive demonstration of the immateriality of the soul, based on sound physical principles. Look, as the last radio links between Tulsa and Houston died away, I'd changed location, at the speed of light, without any increase in mass. And you couldn't tell anybody about your discovery. Exactly. I was racking my brain, one of the few familiar things I could still do, trying to figure out how to communicate my discovery to the journals. At the same time, I was filled with dread and uncertainty. Fortunately, that didn't last long, for the support team soon sedated me into a dreamless sleep. hearing my favorite Brahms piano trio. So that's why they wanted a list of all my favorite recordings. The output from the stereo stylus was being fed through some fancy rectification circuit directly into my auditory nerve. It was mainlining Brahms. It's, it's me. 
Marvin. I, uh, I guess you understood what happened. The transceivers in your skull got uh, broken by the radiation. We are trying to find a new body for you. Yeah, sorry about this, but... Uh, yeah, don't worry, you... You'll be all right. I slept for almost a year. When I woke up, I found myself fully restored to my senses. is my new body. I accommodated to my new body very quickly. The view in the mirror soon became utterly familiar. Hmm. Let's go see good old York. on you for the first time, we made a complete computer duplicate of your brain. We reproduced the complete information processing structure and the computational speed of your brain on a giant computer program. We ran this program side by side with Yorick. All the incoming signals from Hamlet were sent simultaneously to Yorick's transceivers and also to the computer's array of inputs. The outputs from Yorick were not only beamed back to your body, they were also recorded and checked against the simultaneous output of the computer program. Or oh, we call that Hubert, by the way. Hubert? Ah. 
for days, even for weeks, the outputs were identical and synchronous. Now, this does not prove that we made a complete copy of the brain's functional structure, but, well, the empirical support was uh, pretty encouraging. During the days you were disembodied, we kept Hubert's activity parallel with Europe's. And now, for the first time, we have thrown the master switch and put Hubert in complete online control of your body. Your new body, that is. Fortinbras. Come again? Fortinbras. I've decided to call my new body Fortinbras. Uh, by the way, what happened to Hamlet? Yeah. He's still down the stud, I guess. Hey, come on. Show you something. for brain, H is for human. You can switch whenever you want. So I can switch in the middle of a sentence, right? Right. You've got a spare brain, a prosthetic device. Could come in handy if anything happens to Yari. use Yorick as a spare and function on Hubert. It doesn't make any difference. The wear and tear of your body has no debilitating effect on either brain. The one that's controlling your body or the one that wastes its output on the desert air. We decided that all of the electronic connections in the lab had to be carefully locked. And as for those that controlled the life support system for Yorick and the power supply for Hubert, those we protected with elaborate fail-safe devices. And the master control switch, I decided to take charge of myself. I wear it strapped to my waist. I reconnoitre the situation every few months by changing channels. I only do this in the presence of friends, of course, because if the other channel were, uh, heaven forbid, dad, or otherwise occupied, uh, there'd have to be somebody there who, who took my interest to heart to switch it back, to bring me back from the void. Uh, you see, uh, after such a switch, even though I could see and hear and feel and sense whatever was going on in my body, I, I wouldn't be able to control it. But in any case, every time I've tried it so far, uh, nothing's happened. Here, I'll show you. Thank you. God, I thought you'd never turn that key. You can't imagine how terrible it's been these last few weeks. But now you know. It's your turn in purgatory. How I've longed for this moment. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I had to explain it to my uh, brother, I guess you could say. He just gave you all the facts, so I guess you'll understand. About two weeks ago, the two brains drifted just a little bit out of sync. Now, I don't know whether my brain is Hubert or York any more than you do. Well, the two brains drifted apart, and once the process started, it snowballed. The differences magnified, and in no time at all, the illusion that I was in control of my body completely dissipated. Our body. There was nothing I could do. There was no way I could call you. He didn't even know I existed. It's, it's been like being carried around in a cage. No, no, like being possessed. Well, now it's his turn. But at least he'll have the comfort of knowing that I know he's in there. Don't worry. I'll try to make it easy on you. Just as soon as this interview is over, we'll fly to Houston and see what we can do to get you another body. In any case, I'll take care of you. I promise. These people are my witnesses. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this interview we have just heard is not exactly the interview that I would have given. But I can assure you that everything he said was perfectly true. 
But now, if you'll excuse me, I think that I'd, uh, we'd better stop. And what happened to him? He published another book. Well, one of them did. It's about free will. And does it exist? If it didn't, would I be here? That's what it's all about, right? That obsession can come forth out of matter. Then it is rather optimistic about free will. And Hofstadter? He says the difference well, between the highest level and the lowest level. The main thing that that ha the main difference between the lowest level and the highest level is that that the highest level, what really matters is the way things are organized. Um, the patterns that, that things form. And at the low level, there, there isn't enough material to make a pattern. I mean, you have one neuron either on or off. That's not a pattern. But at a high level, when there are large numbers of things involved, they can form large mosaics of activity. And yeah. what really matters is the way in which those large mosaics of activity are interacting, and not particularly that the there's matter down there. So it's interaction that matters. Interaction or pattern. It happens to be embedded or implanted or in a particular kind of hardware. But the pattern, uh, the pattern itself could be implanted in any hardware. Like what? It could, well, I've been trying to give examples uh, involving marbles or something like that, but uh, neurons have been another example. Uh, I, in one of the dialogues in my book here, I uh, used another example. I, I, my microscopic elements were ants, and the intermediate size elements were teams of ants. And then there were larger sizes of teams. There were teams composed of teams, or large organizations, which took on uh, more complex kinds of tasks than a single team could do. And then eventually, I had hypothetical units that I called symbols. Now, these were very, very vast teams of ants that uh, were activated when the ant colony was faced with particular kinds of situations. If you could describe the situation and say, there is um, uh, a certain kind of food out there, or there is a flood, and there's a lot of water out there, you would recognize that those kinds of things would trigger particular kinds of symbols, very large teams, into action. So you could see inside the ant colony activity mirroring the world that it was the ant colony was in. The way to cooperate. For example, an ant, in a, an ant by itself could be in a, uh, caught in a tiny bit of water. And it will act the same as if it's caught in a big, big flood. Ants are pretty mechanical objects. They don't know the global picture. Hmm. But a vast team of ants collectively knows certain kinds of things. And so an ant colony was a metaphor for the collective activity of a brain. And then, of course, the final one that we uh, are talking about is computers. Mm -hmm. um, having uh, computers be another medium in which the kind of pattern can be realized, the patterns that involve perception and awakening of perception, uh, of, of various symbols that create perceptions. So, in the end, if you uh, imagine uh, you'd be able to introduce that kind of patterns into a computer, you'd call the computer uh, conscious by that. I, 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 would feel, I would feel that if you had this kind of perception going on in a computer, yes, that it would be perfectly fine. And that is a possibility since consciousness is an interaction of patterns. The patterns have some base in some kind of hardware, but there is any, those kind of patterns could exist in another kind of hardware. That's yeah. the basic idea. Then. That's the basic idea. So the hardware could be the computer. Hardware could be anything, and uh, the, as long as there's enough uh, enough levels of building up a pattern from the smallest to the largest. As long as there's enough levels, then, then you can form any kind of pattern. And uh, in particular, this kind of pattern is something that we're aiming at. Mm -hmm. um, consciousness, but what about soul? Well, human beings have uh, a lot of different names that whenever you've tried to explain one thing, they will say, but what about this other thing? 
And they keep on jumping from one thing to another thing to another thing. If it's not soul, then it's... Um, there's a term in philosophy called intentionality. And if it's not that, then it's self. And if it's not self, then it's the I, the capital I. Yeah. And if it's not that, then it's uh, something else. And they keep on saying, but you, you can, maybe you could capture this mechanically, but not that. Um, I think we're just going to have to uh, open our minds up to uh, the reality of complex structures, complex mechanisms, having more and more what we call consciousness. And when they do, they will start talking about themselves using the word I, just as we do. And if they'd use it with all the same kinds of subtlety and finesse that we do, I think it's very going to be hard to deny to them that they have an I, to deny that they have a soul, if we have souls. To me, the word soul is really just synonymous with consciousness. It does not, it's not any different from it. I don't think you've changed the question. You say, okay, consciousness, we can imagine a machine having, but not soul. I would even go further and I would say, once you admit the idea that a machine could perceive, could be a perceiving being, I think you've gone f as far as you need to go in saying that it would have some degree of consciousness and the same degree of having a soul, if you, know, you want to use those terms. In other words, the critical part of all of this is the, uh, is the perception. That's what really matters. And once you get that, the rest of the words that go along with consciousness are all going to be there at once and for the same reason they all mean the same thing um, free will <laughs> to just doesn't exist doesn't exist no no then what is it that we perceive as free will we can't predict ourselves. We can't uh, say what we're going to do. But we do know that we have certain kinds of desires. We're familiar with ourselves. We're very familiar with ourselves. And so the best way of explaining our own behavior is to talk about things that we don't really understand, but we just have experienced over and over again. And these things are our desires. And so instead of really knowing where choices come from, we just attribute them to these unexplained things uh, that are too complex for us to figure out called desires. And we just say, well, I wanted to do this. And uh, we never analyze where the desires came from or what the desires uh, really are and, and so how they interact. But if you looked carefully enough, you'd find that all of these desires come from, um, all of these actions come from uh, very uh, clear interaction of very tiny very many tiny parts all adding up. Um, I mean, it's much more efficient for brains to operate without knowing how they operate. The, the sensations that we have are not those of accuracy about how, where our feelings come from, because that's not evolutionarily important. To know where our ideas come from doesn't matter, as long as they work well in the universe. And for us to try to penetrate that opaque region is uh, very difficult. So I, I feel that, that free will is a grand illusion and it's very useful. It's good, in, it's good for survival. It's good to think that you have free will. It helps you explain your own behavior, helps you explain the behavior of other people um, because you're not, you're, you're, your perceptual net is not fine-grained enough to understand it in detail. So a coarse-grained explanation one that involves concepts like will and desires and so forth, will suffice and is usually very good. Don't let it get you down. Well, this might interest you. The universe is infinite but bounded. And therefore, a beam of light, in whatever direction it may travel, will after billions of centuries return, if powerful enough, to the point of its departure. And it is no different with rumor that flies about from star to star, 
and makes the rounds of every planet. One day, Trell heard distant reports of two mighty constructor benefactors, so wise and so accomplished that they had no equal. This news, he ran to Caporcius, who explained to him that these were not mysterious rivals, but only themselves, for their fame had circumnavigated space. In those days, Trell was exceedingly vain, receiving all marks of veneration and honor paid to him as his due and a perfectly normal thing. I'd been flying for quite some time, passing these spheres full of the clamor of war, as well as spheres that had finally obtained perfect peace and desolation. When suddenly, a small planet came into view, really more a stray fragment of matter than a planet. Celsius the Tartarian, ruler of Pancreon and Cispendora. Our subjects, in a fit of regicidal madness, have driven us from the throne and exiled us here on this barren asteroid. And who are you? I'm Troll. Troll, the benefactor? Then you must help us immediately. You must restore us to our rightful position. They shall no longer prevent us from exercising our power. Let's go! Right now! I have no intention of complying with this request, as this would bring about untold evil and suffering. Yet, I wanted to comfort the humiliated king and consult him. I had this idea, which I knew would satisfy him completely without putting his former subjects in jeopardy. So, I rolled up my sleeves and, summoning up all my mastery, I built an entire new kingdom. I built towns, rivers, hills, forests, and brooks. A sky with clouds, armies full of daring do, citadels, castles, ladies' chambers. I made marketplaces, gaudium, gleaming in the sun. I made days of back-breaking labor, and nights full of dancing and song until dawn, and the gay tinkling of glasses. A handful of traitors. A sprinkling of heroes, a pinch of prophets and seers, one messiah, and one great poet. Here you are, sir. You can rule over it forever. With these, you can program wars, quell rebellions, exact tributes, collect taxes, do everything you need to rule. Hmm. Yes, sir. Yes, I see.
I also instructed him in the critical points and transitional states of that micro-miniaturized society. In other words, I explained to him the, the ways of palace coups and revolutions. He was an old hand in the running of tyrannies and instantly grasped the directions and issued a few trial proclamations without much hesitation. These proclamations declared um, a state of emergency, a curfew, a special levy, uh, martial law. After a year had passed in that kingdom, which amounted to no more than a few minutes of the king and I, uh, he abolished, he abolished by an act of the greatest magnanimity, by a flick of the finger, the controls, you see, he abolished one death penalty, uh, lightened the levy, and deigned to annul the special state of emergency. <laughs> you should have heard the people. A tumultuous cry of gratitude rose up from the box like the, the squeaking of tiny mouse lifted up by their tails. <laughs> and with the magnifying glass, we could see them on the highways, on, on the banks of the rivers, in the streets, uh, <laughs> rejoicing and praising the, the unsurpassed benevolence of their sovereign lord. Hmm. <laughs> well, it's a bit small. But I must admit that government is not measured in meters and kilograms. And that emotion seemed genuine enough. Yes. Well, thank you. Hmm. Thank you. understood you correctly. Have you given that despot, that slave driver, that born sadist, a whole civilization to rule over forever? And do you tell me his people cried out for joy when he repealed a fraction of his merciless decrees? Troll, how could you do such a thing? I must be joking, really. The whole kingdom fits into a box, uh, three feet by two by two and a half. It's only a model. A model? A what? What do you mean of what? Of a civilization, obviously. Except that it's a hundred million times smaller. And how do you know there aren't civilizations a hundred times larger than ours? And is ours then a model? Anyway, what importance do dimensions have? A journey from the center of the box to one of the corners takes months for the inhabitants of the box. And don't they suffer? Don't they need the burden of labor? Don't they die? Now, wait a minute. You know yourself that all these processes take place only because I program them, and so they aren't genuine. Oh, they aren't genuine. So the box is empty. And all these processions, parades, and beheadings are all a mere illusion. Not an illusion, no, since they have reality. They're purely a certain microscopic phenomena which I produce by manipulating atoms. The point is that all these births, loves, acts of heroism, denunciations are nothing but the minuscule caperings of uh, electrons in space, which I arrange with all the skill of my craft, which, of course... Enough of your boasting. Are these processes self-organized, or are they not? Of course they are. And they occur within the infinitesimal clouds of electron charges. You know they do. But even when we dream, what happens in our brain but the binary algebra of connecting and disconnecting charges? The continual meandering of electrons. You have taken untold number of creatures capable of suffering and abandoned them forever to the rule of a merciless tyrant. Troll, you have committed a terrible crime. She has sophistry. It's, it's impossible to say whether they suffer in the process. The electrons jumping about in their heads will tell you nothing of that. But if I look inside your head, all I will see is also electrons jumping about. No, Troll. A sufferer is not somebody who hands you his suffering so that you can feel it, weigh it, bite it like a coin. A sufferer is somebody who behaves like a sufferer. Prove to me, here and now, that they do not suffer, that they do not think, that they do not in any way exist as conscious beings. Prove it to me. Prove that you only imitated suffering and did not create it. You know that's impossible. Even before I started, when the box was still empty, I had to anticipate the possibility of just such a proof in order to rule it out. 
Otherwise, the, the monarch of that kingdom, sooner or later, would have got the impression that his subjects were not real subjects at all, but puppets, marionettes. Try to understand there was no other way to do it. I understand that. I understand that only too well. You set out with the noblest of intentions. You set out to create a kingdom so lifelike that nobody, but nobody could tell the difference. Well, in that you've succeeded only too well. Only an hour has gone by since his return. But for them, the inhabitants of that box, whole centuries have gone by. How many generations have suffered. How many lives have been wasted and thrown away. And all to gratify the vanity of King Excelsius. and think later. What do you intend to do when we get there? I'll take the kingdom away from them. And what will you do with it? I'll destroy it. I'll hold an election. Let the people choose a just ruler from among themselves. You program them all to be feudal lords or obedient serfs. What's the good of an election? First you'd have to change the whole structure of society and start again from scratch. And where does the changing of structure end and the tampering of minds begin? Somehow they managed to break through the walls of their box and occupy the asteroid. He isn't there. What have they done with him? Look. They've discovered atomic energy. Look there. That seems to be the remains of the box. They've made it into some kind of temple. I did understand. It was only a model after all, a process with a large number of parameters, a mock-up for a monarch to practice on with the necessary feedback, variables, multistats. Yes, yes, but you over-perfected your replica. Not content with building a clockwork mechanism, you created something which was possible, logical, inevitable, and you ended with the very antithesis of a mechanism. Please, say no more. fantasy. What transpires within the brain but the binary algebra of connecting and disconnecting circuits. The continual meandering of electrons. Why do you say in the book that emotions and uh, intelligence are uh, inseparable? Um, 
Because I think that in order for any, uh, any being to exist in, the wor in, a, in a world that it, uh, it has to have some, uh, automatically it, is going, it has to decide on what it wants to do at any given moment. Uh, it, uh, it has to have certain goals or drives that it is trying to achieve. Uh, if it doesn't have such things, if it doesn't decide such things, it'll just follow down random, completely random pathways. So it has to be able to control those pathways, and that means it has to have some principles that are guiding it. And those principles can be called its desires or its goals. And when it finds that it's frustrated, well, that frustration is, in essence, an emotion. Mm -hmm. And when it is looking at itself and uh, attempting to examine how much progress it has made and what kind of progress it is likely to make given the current situation. It can have optimism or pessimism, hope or despair. So the goals artificial intelligence is after are real intelligence, so also uh, real emotions. Well, those goals, I don't know if most people in artificial intelligence would say so. I get the impression or the, for some reason, my my opinion is a minority opinion, but I get the impression that most people in artificial intelligence would be perfectly uh, happy talking about intelligence without any emotions. But uh, according to your theory, that is not really feasible in the end. Yeah, I don't think that makes any sense. I don't think it, it could exist. But the, most people in the field, I guess, think uh, that the two have nothing to do with each other. Yeah. But uh, because um, what if you reach the goal, you, you, there are a lot of moral problems on the horizon right then, right? I mean, uh, you talk about it vaguely in, in the book. Uh, actually, not uh, you, you sort of evade it. You say, somebody uh, says that uh, a computer cannot really think unless it knows how to cry. And you say that's a very, very deep issue. Unfortunately, many uh, AI workers at this time are unwilling for various reasons to take this sort of point uh, seriously. But in some ways, those uh, AI workers are right. It is a little premature to think about computers crying. Uh, but isn't it like saying, uh, well, we've got uh, the atoms. We know if we uh, put them together, they might make a big bang. And, but it's very premature to think about atomic uh, war, etc. Well, if one could see very clearly that something uh, bad was going to come of computers uh, having uh, emotions, then maybe, uh, maybe it would be bad. But the way I look at artificial intelligence is that it's uh, trying to understand what the mind is and not trying to replace anybody by anything. And um, if it turns out that... Uh, See, I don't believe that we're uh, likely to create a machine that has our kinds of emotions or intelligence. I don't, I don't think that's going to happen for an awful long time. For an awful long time, but you do think it is possible? It might happen, you know. So at the moment you do think it is possible, and at the moment you're working really in, at the goal that has to do with that, shouldn't you start thinking about the moral aspects of Moral for who? Well, it's, uh, play, uh, couldn't you call it play God, uh, Frankenstein, uh, cre creating Well, supposing that the creatures that we create are, are very moral creatures, then it might be best for the world. Suppose, but that is the starting of a... Well, I'd, all I mean is how do I know? I don't know anything about what would happen. Mm. Uh, Neither did the people who invented the car. How did they know that there was going to be a, a terrible parking problem when, you know, on Beacon Hill where I live? I mean, they didn't think about that, and they didn't think it was going to make life inconvenient for me and make me park every day uh, more than a mile away from where I live. The people who invented the car weren't worried about problems of people that were going to take place 80 or 90 years later. All they did was they said, we want to be able to move from here to there without using horses. And uh, they didn't know that it was going to create uh, gigantic economic problems having to do with oil and so forth. Mm -hmm. now you can, are you going to blame them? I mean, you might say, well, isn't it going to get out of hand? Well, who says it's going to get out of hand? Who says that we're going to have robots suddenly proliferating all over the place? 
We might. But That's even if we did, fiction. even if we did, maybe that would be better. Maybe it would be better for the Earth to have. I mean, maybe it would be better if the human race, um, instead of transmitting its, uh, uh, itself forward by means of um, biology, transmitted itself forward by means of artificial creation and, and left as its successors the, um, these beings. How do I know? If, there, if such a thing happened. I, I mean, all I'm saying is I'm not convinced that the human race is the most important thing in the in the world, and I, I think, uh, uh, you know, we can't control what's going to happen in, in the future. Um, we want things to be good, but on the other hand, um, we aren't so good ourselves. We're no angels. Uh, if there were creatures that were more moral and more good than us, wouldn't we wish them to have uh, uh, the future rather than us? If it turns out that the creatures that we created were creative and very, very altruistic and gentle beings, and we are people who go around killing each other all the time and having wars, wouldn't it be better if the altruistic beings just survived and we didn't?